All right. So what, what brought you into politics? So again, my name is Jake Tonkel. I'm mm -hmm. running for Jose City Council in District 6, which is the central west part of San Jose. And been in and out of politics for a long time. I give a lot of credit to my mom, who was studying women's studies and social work uh, through UC Santa Cruz and then San Jose State mm -hmm. uh, when I was young. Um, and through you know what she was reading and studying, you know, a lot of that filtered in um, to us as kids. We ended up at anti-war protests in 2003 and four, um, and that just kind of stuck with me. Mm. Then uh, in college, so I'm a biomedical engineer. I work at a small startup uh, during the day right now, but my minor in college was essentially environmental politics, environmental sociology. It's called sustainability studies. Mm. So it was kind of overarching view mm. of that intersection. Mm. And as you're going through, you know, a technical route where I was certainly, you know, interested in renewable energy and we were talking about the different capacities that we need to transition to a clean and healthy planet. Yeah. The challenge always came up as a political one, mm. not a technological one. Uh, we have the capacity to make the change that we make. We just don't have the leaders that are willing to make it. Ah. Um, and so that drove a lot of my interest in politics. And then in local politics, being acutely aware that while most people look to the federal government for how the United States is going to run itself, essentially, uh, the implementation is at the local level and the local level has the ability to improve upon this bare minimum that the federal government sets. If, he, if we're talking on an economic scale, federal minimum wage is then superseded by, in San Jose, a $15 minimum wage, mm. right? Because we have higher costs of living. Uh, the same thing would go for issues around climate, would go for um, issues around transportation. You have the capacity to really focus in at these local levels. Um, and that was just a huge interest of mine. Been an activist for a lot of years uh, in and around San Jose, working on the divestment movement uh, and then into the public banking movement. And again, one of the issues around the you know, Dakota Access Pipeline was attacking the banks that were funding a project that while to them was profitable to the community was not only you know damaging from a health impact effect or an environmental impact effect but you're know, destroying the native culture um, of the indigenous people you know the lakota sioux um, and working in that space as far away as the city of san jose was still really meaningful and impactful so that kind of brought me um, into the the city of san jose as we were asking them to divest and to leave from Wells Fargo and, and move on from there. Yeah, I I, uh, I saw one of your speeches that uh, uh, that they did. Um, and you were talking about a uh, uh, decentralizing the bank or some of that. Uh, maybe I was hearing that wrong, but uh, basically, it sounds like you wanted to do like a post office. Uh, bank of sorts in my right or my wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, there's some nuance to it, but that was kind of my thing prior to running for office. Um, over the last couple of years, I'm probably known down, at least in San Jose, as the public banking guy. Mm. There, you know, are, are two lines to it really, because mm. you have banking aspect to the community. Mm -hmm. Where do you have to pull money out of an ATM? Who do you go for for a car loan? And a lot of people, myself included, believe that uh, postal banking is a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. We've got post, office, post offices all over. They already have you know, employees and infrastructure in place. It would be you know, a, a few small tweaks and changes and a software update so that they could start to handle money in this new way. And then there's the, 
municipal budgeting side, right? A lot of the reason around the first step for public banking was that as more and more cities were realizing it is both a financial harm to them and their the constituents, the citizens, to be investing in institutions like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, that do not have our community's health and safety at the forefront of their decision-making process. Mm. As they decided to do that, they realized they didn't have anywhere else to go. We do have you know, some great credit unions, socially responsible you know, benefit banks um, within the Silicon Valley, within San Jose, that can do a lot of good with people's money, individuals' mm -hmm. money. But if you were to take the one to four billion dollars that city of San Jose works with, or the eight to nine billion dollars that the county of Santa Clara works with, and try and put that into a credit union, the risk would be so overwhelming for that small institution financially mm -hmm. that they would never agree to it. Mm -hmm. And so the public bank is a way where you can take government money and then utilize it to partner with local banks mm. so that we take on the risk, but we also take on the reward. And knowing that a strong network of banking systems, healthy, small, connected, lead us to the capacity to have a much healthier ability to respond in a crisis like this, you know, mm -hmm. COVID, where we have a massive economic downturn, huge, you know, billions of dollars, probably trillions of dollars in need for investment into healthcare supplies so that we can transition people back to work that we need to get the economy going again. That all has to come from somewhere. And we know the large Wall Street private banks aren't going to make that happen. They've become even more profitable over the last four or five months because they just get to eat up everybody else's assets that go yeah. bankrupt. Right. And yeah. So without going into the public banking too long, because there's lots of people that um, are more have more expertise than I do, uh, that I'm sure would love to come on and talk. That was a big piece of my activism prior to city council. Hmm. Now, were you recruited to do this, or uh, did you just say one day you might as well threw your hat in the race and it worked? I was not recruited to do it. We, you know, I've got friends that always say you should run for office, just being politically engaged. I think so many of us do have people that aren't politically engaged say, hey, you should go do this. Mm -hmm. But it was never really a big um, aspiration, in all honesty. But I sat down with people hoping that there was someone that was going to run for this seat that was progressive would be willing to you know put in the hard work to make the change that both district six and the city of san jose need mm -hmm. and there weren't quite very many people in that capacity yeah. especially that were ready to run against an incumbent one that's well funded um because there's all types of nuances to politics yeah. and so district six was the last district that you know was competitive, how would I put it, that had a challenger. Hmm. We had four districts that were up for re-election in 2020 for California, March of 2020. And all the other candidates had announced in like March or April, you know, a couple in May. And I was looking around for who was going to announce, you know, the challenge in district six. And couldn't find anybody, you know, didn't hear whispers from people. Um, and so in July, I decided to, with a couple of friends, sit down and say, I think we can make this happen. It's democracy. Everyone deserves a challenger. It's going to be a lot of hard work, but hmm. so far we're making it happen. Yeah, there you go. Well, that sounds nice as far as the part goes. And it sounds like you're doing a bang up job as far as, far as that goes. Um, uh, now, who, uh, who is the uh, incumbent? The incumbent's name is Dev Davis. Dev Davis. And uh, uh, Democrat, Republican, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not, I don't follow that much in, in California politics. No worries. Uh, when she was elected in 2016, she was a registered Republican. And then recently, 2017, I believe, decided to change to be no party preference. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So basically, uh, she pulled um, uh, the the uh, the uh, commentator on MSNBC. What is his name? Um, Joe Scarborough. I remember. I remember hearing uh, him and his wife decided to become uh, independent after Trump was uh, elected. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I I uh, recently realized that they are both they are both pretty much part part of the same um, overall party. And they're they're both uh, going for to see the um, the uh, donors' money and to do what donors want pretty much and leave our else out of the cold. So that's the why I'm I'm trying to uh, get as many greens as many leftists on and talking as much, uh, much as I can because there, there are so many um, cable news uh, outlets that already have the mainstream pundits on, mainstream candidates on. So, uh, and um, I'm very happy that someone like yourself is running for our office uh, and I'm hoping that more come out like, like yourself. Uh, now, uh, were you ever a Bernie Sanders fan? I had volunteered for Bernie Sanders back in, in 2016. Um, I you know, was a registered green from the time I turned 18. So it, it was really the first time that someone, you know, on a national scale that wasn't a, um, a Green Party candidate that resonated with what I thought the direction for the United States needed to go. Yeah. So. It's unfortunate, 2016, then 2020, uh, that that didn't happen. But I think it's taught the those of us that are strong supporters and understand, you know, that progressive values have to be fairly unwavering. That our focus can really be on local candidates, mm. building a bench, getting people elected at the local level, because you can make a lot of impact by changing the makeup of your city council, of your state legislature, uh, before having to deal with the mil hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that go into federal level and presidential level races. Mm. Uh, how, ma uh, how many uh, pieces of legislation do you think you would actually have at the ready for uh, uh, if or once you become, become a, a council member? We've got a, a team working on legislation policy in every capacity of the main priorities I have, whether it's moving to publicly funded elections, whether it's moving to invest in community land trusts, uh, create small business loan programs and work a cooperative incentive uh, loans so that especially during this downturn as businesses just up and leave, Mm -hmm. owned by you know hedge funds corporations that we can make sure the employees are the ones that can buy the facility and the equipment as that gets shut down and then continue that operation within our community so there's lots of things that we're really excited to implement and i know my team is doing an amazing job getting it all ready for us uh, come january 2021 i'm good well i'm glad to hear that uh, and uh, what's kind of I, I, I try to ask um, everybody that I, I, I interview, um, which is kind of a, a very young uh, career so far, but still, uh, I asked another Green Party member, uh, member who's running, who running for governor, I'll just say, um, uh, if uh, if say a, a big corporation in California in your district. Um, or if you want to get uh, tax incentives to stay, uh, would you uh, put uh, a would you put something in the paperwork saying that if you do wind up leaving uh, this uh, leaving the city or leaving this district, uh, uh, would you uh, then return uh, ninety percent of the tax incentives? Because that way, uh, the your district wouldn't lose any money. And it was that way it would go into re, uh, retraining or reestablishing those in, those then and former employees into another uh, job. I, I think that's a really astute point 
the other challenge we face is I, I'm not in favor of giving anybody subsidies to come into the city of San Jose uh, because we have mechanisms in place that are supposed to make it a fair deal. And I, I, well, as soon I, I, as every city gets to this you know, race to the bottom, we are, you know, Silicon Valley, we've got a lot of small cities in the area, a couple of large cities. We don't want to be, you know, giving away tax dollars to companies that don't need them so that it comes to San Jose instead of Santa Clara. We have to realize that people that work in Santa Clara live in San Jose, people that live in Santa, Santa Clara work in San Jose, mm. and those governments have to work together to say these are fair deals for wherever you end up. Because it, otherwise, we're going to have you know, problems that we already have in the city of San Jose, where we don't get the requirements from companies that want to come in in order to mitigate gentrification, in order to mitigate displacement, in order to mitigate the in affordable housing we're going to need. Because tech jobs, which is generally what people speak about when they talk about these corporations at the moment, um, you know, they're not pulling in a a lot of manufacturing jobs into San Jose through a Toyota plant or something. Mm. We don't have the space, but when we're talking about tech jobs, they support for every one tech job. I think there's four between four and five uh, service level jobs that get supported by that person. And we need those service level workers to be able to have quality of life in our city and not end up trying to rent or two, three, four hours outside of San Jose and commute in every day. Yeah. It takes time away from them, away from their health, their mental health, time away from their family, time away from them being an active and engaged member in their own community or in our own community. It's important that we have the ability for every type of working class person to live uh, healthy lives in the city of San Jose. Hmm. Uh, has uh, your district uh, been um... A victim of source to the to outsourcing at all? It's you know, all kind of convoluted. We certainly have had you know, some manufacturing jobs in the district in the past, and they are slowly being transitioned out. We are you know, working on bringing in a lot of tech money, which is from the current city council, bringing in companies like Google, and that has you know, displacement effects on residents. Yeah. And displacement of uh, residents uh, making rent higher, making uh, cost of living higher. Uh, that's actually why I moved from Washington State and into Ohio. It's because a lot of that actually happened in Washington State. Um, and yeah, it, it, that's difficult when I'm like myself, I'm, I'm uh, living on Social Security. So that's just why I initially got into this, but at the same time, I also know that there's uh, a lot of people out there uh, that don't get the uh, attention they deserve as far as uh, any kind of coverage. So it kind of go hand in hand as far as that part goes. But, um, well, I'm, it sounds like not a lot of displacement has happened in your district in regards to that, which is good. Um, I would have to say over the last couple of decades, it's been quite a bit. Yeah, it's been quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, We're talking about neighborhoods that used to be very working class that are now totally turned over apartment complexes, tech money. Uh, it certainly made the district more and more uh, white in all actuality. We had some strong, healthy you know, Latinx communities specifically uh, in different parts of the district that are being displaced as well. It, it's an ongoing huge problem for us. But, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how to remedy that? As I mentioned, it's about ensuring that when companies come in, mm -hmm. that they are doing things like local hire, they're paying fair wages, livable wages, and that we don't have this exacerbation of inequality that allows wealthy people to live close to where they work and not our more low income workers to have to move far and far away. That can, you know, it goes in two directions. You can also then put in affordable housing. We have 
absolutely failed as a city to implement the affordable housing we need. It's somewhere like 7% of the permitting goals we have for 2023 that we are at right now. And that's from 2015. So we're over halfway there and we're only 7% of our affordable housing. We're uh, like 94% of our uh, market rate luxury housing already approved. So the market has certainly skewed itself up because we continue to incentivize luxury market rate construction. We have a city council that is certainly uh, can, focusing on trickle down housing, which has not worked and will not work for our community. Uh, so you have to shift that, take some control, whether it's community land trusts, whether it's quality, affordable public housing, we have to start to find a, a healthier balance of what's going on for our city. Mm. Yeah, do you have any uh, online events coming up? We uh, do uh, like the Zoom events uh, and Team Tonkle. Uh, I think the next one we have is a week from this coming Thursday where people can come ask me questions. We talk about how to get involved in the campaign. We've got phone banks every two or three days. So people can certainly help us make phone calls to residents in the district, mm. talk to them, make sure they're okay during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and then see if they're interested in talking a little bit about politics and who they plan to vote for. Mm. There's a I, lot of ways to help out. Yeah, I, yeah and uh, by the way, uh, how are you... Uh... Uh, how how are how are you and your volunteers uh, coping, and, uh, and how are you guys are doing uh, campaigning in, in this kind of environment? We're doing really well. I think it, we've adapted much better than a lot of other campaigns. It's been a lot more social media, a lot, of obviously, a lot of virtual events. Um, it's harder and harder to build kind of relationships through the team through a virtual setting. Yeah. But we've had a lot of great you know, open conversation. We're really focused on making sure that this is a team effort. You know, policy is looked at across the team. It's not just coming from me. So that there's value in each and every person that comes in and helps out. Mm. And I think that's allowed us to really overcome the challenge that might be, hey, come over, phone bank, and eat pizza, which is – while it is lovely and I would ha happily get back to that so that we could have, you know, that close connection. Yeah. Because there's so much passion and value in making sure the city of San Jose works for everyone from our volunteers, we've been able to avoid a lot of that. Now, did you, now, I think I saw the interview or maybe you said earlier that you have a degree in, um, oh, just something in the bio. I'm a okay. biomedical engineer. My degree's in mechanical engineering. Yeah. Mechanical engineering, okay. Because uh, I, I, I know that we're still looking for a, a treatment for this. And I, 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 forget, I forgot which one actually uh, does that kind of work. So that's why I was asking. Them. <laughs> Say that one more time. You're looking for what? Uh, I, 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 I forgot uh, what degree in that you had. So that's why I was asking because I know we're still looking for a treatment for COVID-19 and I didn't know if you had that kind of degree or not. <laughs> no, no. Uh, mechanical side, we do in surgical tools. So we're a bit outside the, the COVID-19 realm. That oh, oh, well. <laughs> I thought I asked you as far as the part goes. A lot of smart people working on it. We need to make sure we're supporting them. Uh, well, I mean, uh, do you know, I mean, I, I haven't actually heard of any companies that are actually doing that. Do you know what uh, companies that are actually doing that? I don't know. I remembered a couple months back when Trump started giving mm. billions of dollars to companies to start to develop different treatments or vaccines, etc. cetera. Um, but in all honesty, his speech was ripe with corporate giveaways and was not focused on oh, yeah. uh, a community community health, I guess you would say. Yeah. Um, there was a clear when you bring in heads of bill, trillion dollar pharmaceutical companies say we're going to give them money and then they get to go sell whatever it is they create rather than giving it to our community that needs it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. 
Uh, how, do you know how much uh, medication that does actually go through California, maybe go uh, come from Canada? Do you know how much uh, of that does actually go, go through California? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I thought I asked again. <laughs> um, what, what is the average donation that you do get? Average donation, I think now we're up to about $100. We were floating around 96 for our first reporting period. So it's been some amazing friends and family. I think we were talking with back and forth with our team because to us, you know, people that looked up to Bernie Sanders, other grassroots candidates, a hundred dollars is a lot. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think it, as well as we look at what running for office on a local level means, a majority of my donors are people I know personally, mm -hmm. friends, family, you know, um, parents of kids I played soccer with growing up, my old teachers. Yeah that's going to be a, a an ability to generate a donation that's not just $25 that's not just $30 so that's been a huge help for us incredibly grateful to every one that's donated whether i had known them or not uh, prior to running for office but we're doing really well well I, i'm i'm glad to hear that uh that Bernie Sanders was the only one that was actually great i mean able to raise some money on individual uh, donors, as far as the park house is, and that, to hear about yeah, hear, I mean, to hear about that, that is good. I was just gonna say, relative to the way the city council races usually go, uh, we're three, four times as many individual donors than your normal candidate running through this process. Mm -hmm. We're not the first in total fundraising amount, obviously, because we're a grassroots effort but we're doing a really good job. The community has been incredibly supportive. Mm. Uh, proud of it. Good. And uh, you mentioned that you're what, waiting for the endorsement from um, uh, the Sunrise Movement or, movement, or am, I, am I wrong about that? We're reaching out to a, a lot of amazing progressive groups, you know, filling out questionnaires, whether it's you know, Sunrise, Our Revolution. Um, you know, we've got a lot of amazing endorsements already. So we're continuing to, one, learn from their questionnaires. Everybody asks questions differently. It's good to get that input into how I want to answer things in, you know, maybe what policy we might have missed or don't, haven't touched on enough. But then it's also you know, a way for us to connect with new voters, new donors, new supporters, new volunteers, because everyone within the progressive left, especially, we all have our niches. You're either a 350.org volunteer or a Sierra Club volunteer or a Sunrise volunteer. And it's, while you may hear about us getting a different endorsement, it's good for us to get that endorsement directly from the individual groups. Mm. Uh, have you got any, uh, any endorsements from like um, socialist connected uh, uh, groups like uh, SPUSA or the Socialist Alternative, you know, something like that? I have the local Peace and Freedom Party's endorsement, actually. Oh, okay. That, that sounds nice. Right on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Was there anything else you wanted to, uh, to talk about as far, as far as your campaign? We covered a lot of it. Uh, you know, again, I will just plug, if you're interested in helping us out, we are less than two months till ballots get, or almost exactly two months until ballots get mailed out in California which means we're two months away from people starting to vote. We are in my relative expertise neck and neck with the incumbent and looking to make quite a big change for the city of San Jose, the 10th largest city in the country. So it would be huge if we could make this grassroots corporate free um, progressive switch for this seat. And anybody that's watching, please go to my website jake4d6.com, sign up to volunteer. If you can, please donate even you know, one, five, $15. It goes a long way when we're all in this together. And I would really appreciate it. Well, uh, you can, uh, you, you just know that I'll be sharing the, you know what, out of this and um, try and put more of your word out. And uh, maybe you can do the same as far as that part goes. Huh? <laughs> 
I'll do my best. We, I will. Yeah, I, I'm a young network as far as the bar goes and trying to highlight every bar left or even just a barely left uh, uh, person out there. So uh, anybody who subscribes to this channel and uh, and donates to mine, I'll let you guys know what that is later on. Just by him, not me. Uh, so, uh, but I, I really do appreciate you being on, being on my show and, um, I wish you the very best and I Thank will, you. I, I will, uh, now we, we talk on Twitter, right? Yes. Okay. Twitter. I, I, yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to, uh, to reconnect you with, with the code pen that I was talking about. Sounds good. So, uh, but thank you very much for being on the show and, uh, I wish you very, I wish you all the luck in the world and, uh, uh, people who are, well, uh, watching this, uh, donate as much as you can to his campaign. Uh, he, he, uh, he obviously is, uh, smart enough to be able to take care of, the, take care of business in his district. So yes, um, support this guy. He, uh, he deserves your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I guess you could say I, I endorse you. Anyway, uh. Absolutely appreciate. <laughs> Not much of one, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for being here. I'll uh, I'll talk to you on Twitter. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Good night, thank everybody. You. Later.